Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to see that there are still some of you alive and kicking after this morning session. So yes, it has happened to me that um, as a financial advisor and mostly someone who's worked in the corporate world has gotten lost in the Philippine jungle and has worked in a BI function in actually one of the quite successful Southeast Asian startups called Salora. But uh, this session is not about me. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be guiding and leading this upcoming session, uh, which will be about operational risk management and how to plan for financial resilience. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, it might focus a little bit more on the financial planning and management part and less on the operational risk management part, given my own background. But I really encourage you to um, uh, post any questions you have that part uh, on the online platform for the questions and we try to kind of bring out those questions and get answers to that part as well. So, um, together with me, uh, I will be having three amazing speakers. Please come on stage, every one of you, Marco, Rina and Adrian. And um, without any further delay, I will allow them, each one of them, to introduce themselves. Um, one and a half minutes, how you want to introduce yourself, also say something fun about you. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, Adrian, uh, let's see, introduction quickly. Uh, born in Cuba, uh, moved to the States when I was a teenager, did about 15 years of corporate finance dues uh, in that side of the world. And at one point in life, um, my wife and I got tired of having to evacuate for hurricanes. So we said we were leaving Florida. Um, we built a financial model and Estonia won uh, that model between uh, San Diego, Washington and Tallinn. So I've um, been here for about two and a half years. I um, started working uh, for a, a lovely startup called Jabatical um, in Estonia. And then uh, about a year ago, I moved to uh, Starship to head their uh, European accounting uh, operations. Uh, fun fact, uh, I have two children who have their own secret language now because they can speak Estonian and mom and I can't. So <laughs> whenever they don't want us to understand, they just speak Estonian to each other, which is wonderful to see. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my name is Rina, uh, currently working for Verif. I have been working with startups uh, for the last 15 years, and usually I am like interim person, member of board, taking care of finance, HR, internal IT offices, whatever it's needed. And uh, I have been helping out a few of these startups uh, to, to clear, clean uh, everything to do with finance and accounting, and then move forward uh, and growing forward. So, Bolt, uh, Zero Turnaround, Moniz, and Skype. Thank you. Marco? Uh, yep, I'm Marco. I'm currently a CFO and co-founder of MeetFrank. Uh, MeetFrank is a HR marketplace for passive talent, where you can be available on the job market on your own terms. Uh, I mainly deal with all the financial and operational issues, so I'm the, I'm the numbers guy in, in the startup. Uh, previously, I was a CFO and, uh, and member of the board at Top Invest, which is one of the largest family offices in the region. And even before that, I was a financial consultant in, in PwC. So my background relates to finances, capital raising, M&A, financial management. And uh, yeah, I'm a finance guy, so not too much of fun to say about me. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, that was very insightful. Um, I think uh, we still have to touch a little bit upon this uh, COVID crisis, and I think it would be also interesting for the audience to hear from, from your experience as well. So can you perhaps shed a little bit light on how you handled the current still ongoing crisis, and what were the kind of key lessons you learned, and that from operation risk and financial planning point of view? Um, is there something, because I'm sure this was not something you actually would have planned for. Um, so maybe, um, Rina, Marco. 
Yeah, my fun fact was I joined uh, Verif uh, in the beginning of April, so in the middle of crisis, in the middle of fundraising, and also in the middle of uh, lay of plan. And uh, I had to learn about the company very fast, about the financial model in place at that point, about the clients, uh, why they need our services, uh, what's going on, uh, what's the cost structure, what we should do, and so on and so on. And to support our uh, founder and uh, CEO, Karel, uh, to, to, to do some drastic uh, decisions. And uh, we had pretty big layoff. Karel uh, has been sharing this experience before, and definitely she said he, this was one of his um, most uh, painful experiences because this was the first time he had to do that. So I had to support him, and the HR supported him as well, very well. So in the end of the day, it went well. Um, uh, what else we did? Uh, this crisis uh, affected every, every, uh, every sector differently. And uh, many of our clients are from finance, uh, tech, fintech, or crypto. Mm -hmm. And uh, the situation was pretty vague. Uh, so first, what we did is so we got in touch with all of our clients and made sure what's going on how we can help them, what's going to be the prognosis of usage of our uh, product, and uh, what kind of conclusions we can draw. Should we resuffle maybe payment plans, uh, payment terms, and so on. And also collecting cash, make sure we get cash in. Marco, maybe you, have, um, you can share your, your experience with this crisis. Yeah, sure. It was pretty fun. So for us in the recruitment industry, as you can imagine, the, the hit was pretty big because if you see some uncertainty in the macro environment, what is the first thing you do? You probably stop your hiring. So this is what we did and what also many of our clients did. So the hit was pretty big and it forced us to rethink the whole business model and all the operational processes. And uh, now, having almost climbed out of, of that hole, uh, things look much better and uh, actually found much more efficiency in our operations than we expected. So now in August, uh, we'll exceed our pre-crisis numbers, but our cost base is almost 40% lower. So it forced us to rethink everything and in the end, I believe we emerged much stronger from the crisis are, and are now on a much more sustainable path. Adrian, what was your key lesson from this crisis? Key lesson, I have to say, um, uh, to, to make sure that the financial model that we use in the organization to aid our decision-making process is robust enough to handle all the scenarios. So, no, we didn't plan for Right. The world's shutting down and all our university campuses shutting down. Uh, but we do have robust enough financial capabilities that, that, that once we saw things shutting down, that we can adjust. Uh, we knew which levers we had uh, to play with and, and we were able to adjust them uh, quickly. I mean, when you have a fleet of almost a, a thousand robots and, and all of a sudden they're not in the place where they're supposed to be because the place where they're in is, is closed. Um, you have to be able to have a model that allows you to, to, to ship them uh, essentially across the world to wherever they need to be. So for us, the, the, the lesson was um, have robust uh, financial planning capabilities. Right, that's, um, that's very interesting. Um, going back a little bit on the HR part as well, um, we discussed with Rina also earlier that um, kind of the first instinct you have when you're going to hit the crisis situation is to try to re reduce your costs. And... Um, but what are, the, what are the risks associated with uh, massive kind of layoffs, um, Rina? Uh, and when you should actually try to uh, rethink, uh, kind of think about really how, how, how much you're going to do, uh, how much um, redundancies you're going to have to make, and what, when it's actually going to be risky to, to go to, too kind of far with that? The truth is you don't know because uh, nobody knew what's going to happen, uh, how long uh, it takes until the crisis is over, uh, how long it takes to, to recover, uh, what's the situation of our clients, what kind of volumes we need, because it wasn't about laying off, I don't know, some support function people or 
for engineers it was um, in our case it was mostly people serving the clients uh, but we had this success buffer already before the situation so we already were thinking about that anyway because we try to provide an automatic service. Part of that is still done manually, and we have been able to increase automation constantly, and therefore we already had this buffer before, uh, but uh, we kind of didn't take this decision early enough uh, because um, we thought our customer base and then the volumes are going to be growing before the crisis started. Therefore, we, we had this buffer. And uh, at some point, we had to decide about uh, not only reducing the cost, but it was more about uh, also um, doing what we had been done anyway. Right. So my experience with um, startups is Estonian startup founders are very uh, economical thinking, and, and uh, they always try to have very low costs. And most of the companies uh, usually deal with um, any excess resources immediately, whatever it is. Is it the uh, office space? Is it something else you don't need? Is it, uh, is it service you don't need? Or is it people who you don't need by some reason? And um, having to have a very strong team to move uh, very fast forward, you, don't, you should, shouldn't have extra load. So I guess this thinking is very uh, common for Estonian startup scene anyway, but some founders are more experienced and some founders are not so experienced. For example, I had to pass a similar kind of crisis uh, 10 years ago as well, and I had to do layoffs 10 years ago as well, and I already knew you have to do it rather sooner than later. And I guess some less experienced startup leaders are thinking like, it's it's very hard decision to take. It's anyway for everybody a very hard decision to take. But uh, but one one of uh, I was talking yesterday to our founder Karel Kotkas and asked for advice what he would pass to our founders, and he said take difficult decisions sooner than, rather than later. Right. Okay. Um, something that you also mentioned earlier um, was that there's this risk that. Um, the employer brand will kind of suffer if you're going to lose some of the strong employees that you had. Um, how would you comment on that? Um, uh, if you do it, uh, if you do it fair, fair way, and you are honest about why you do it, uh, you have good process in place. You support people who have to leave. Uh, you, you, it's, it's, it's. If you, if you act according to your values, whatever you have to do, is it a good or, or, or a difficult thing, uh, it increases the value of your brand. You, if, if you don't follow your values and, and you do it differently, it might be also a good thing you do, but it still might harm you. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to join a strong team. So if you keep your team strong, if you keep your business strong, this is increasing your brand value, both for clients, uh, investors, employees, everybody. Okay, great. Um, I think let's move on to our next discussion topic, which is very much related to this one. And it's about um, financial modeling in the startup context. So I think modeling is one of the ways to basically understand how robust your business plan is. Um, so my question to you is, do you uh, need a solid financial model in the startup context? And um, how kind of detailed this model should be? Um, Adrian, Marco, how would you comment? Uh, well, I can start. Well, you definitely need a model. The level of detail depends on your stage and it depends on the industry. So there are some more disruptive industries, for example, food delivery, where modeling is crucial from day one because the unit economics is something that's going to be heavily scrutinized by the investors. Uh, perhaps some more established industries such as uh, enterprise software, early stage modeling is not that crucial. Uh, overall, modeling details tend to increase with every round. 
at least that's, that's my experience. Uh, but more importantly, I would say that it's important that the financial model and the story go hand in hand. So often what I've seen is that there's a really strong uh, story, but the model, uh, model and the financial numbers don't back it up. And I've also seen it to be the other way, that there's a very strong financial model and numbers, but the story is too weak to actually believe in that model. So make sure those two go hand in hand. I'll add to that that um, when I completely agree that you, you always need the model. However, the robustness um, is also really dependent on, on who the, the end user uh, or, or the consumer of that model is going to be, which usually fluctuates by, uh, by, by stage. If, if you're working on a friends and family round, uh, you don't necessarily need to run two million Monte Carlo simulations and a financial model. Uh, however, when you're in the position where you might be raising 50, 100, 150 million, um, and the robustness of it uh, will, will grow. Uh, what are the key things to kind of uh, focus on if you're building your model? What are the essentials that uh, need to be brought out there? Um, uh, maybe you can focus that. As it also goes to the um, the KPIs, what should be there, like um, how much detail you should actually add to that? Uh, that's a darn good question. Um, with modeling, I, I, I always uh, uh, think that the, the main variables that, uh, that, that control your company should be represented in there. So not just financial items, right. but uh, if, if there's 10 variables that your company lives by, I don't know, we build more robots, we hire more people, uh, we expand to another university, uh, they should be reflected in the model, and most importantly, and uh, the model should tell you uh, what the, kind of like if you have one dollar to spend on any one of these, where is that dollar better spent? Is it better spent on building a new robot, or is it better spent on hiring a new technician? Um, that's so what are the most, uh, basically, it, it, should, it should highlight where you should invest your money in the company, basically, if you have ex excess money. Um, um, maybe we should go back uh, a little bit to day-to-day -to -day business because financial modeling sometimes is not, uh, it's, it's not necessarily something you work with every day. Uh, usually it tends to be that you're going to update your model if you're going to raise capital or some, you, know, you can have some special projects that you need to do. However, um, it might be even more crucial from the financial management and planning point of view to see how you cope with your day-to-day -day business. So. Um, what are the key dimensions of um, finance and operation functions? Uh, and what are the key dimensions of financial management in a startup context? What are the key things that you will focus on a daily basis? Um, what are you tracking? Um, can, you, can you shed some light to that? What are the key things to focus on on a daily basis? Daily basis, cash. Uh, everyone's going to say cash. Um, actually, on a daily basis, uh, we, we focus more on the on the company operations than than the accounting uh, operations. At least at the startup where I work at now, uh, the, the accounting operations are generally uh, looked at on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, in the startup mindset, uh, uh, cash is the most relevant var uh, variable. Uh, with a whole bunch of inputs leading up to cash, but, but cash being um, the most relevant valuable, uh, variable. Marco, do you have something to add here? Yeah, well, as I said, number one is uh, cash flow management and knowing how much runway you have under different uh, scenarios, so scenario planning as well. And, and secondly, uh, know how much flexibility and options you have, both on the revenue side and on the cost side. What I've seen is that finance people often tend to focus more on the cost side, but there are actually several things you can uh, play around with on the revenue side as well. Uh, for example, uh, if you're a software as a service uh, business, you can encourage clients to pay a year, year or half year in advance, offer a small discount, but this helps your, uh, your runway and cash flow a lot. And uh, you, there are also some other things you can play around with the trial period. Uh, you can uh, increase prices for some segments without sacrificing growth. So know the flexibility you have in your income statement. 
And similarly, from the cost side, uh, know what you can cut without uh, sacrificing uh, significant parts of your growth story. Pina, do you have something to add here? Yes, I second uh, to Marco and Adrian. Uh, uh, so uh, I have a similar experience. Uh, usually, startups, uh, when they are still small and only early stage, uh, they outsource the accounting function. So just to make sure invoices are paid, taxes are paid, payroll is taken care of. And uh, if there is a smart co-founder with some kind of management or financial background, maybe he's going to be the one or she's going to be the one thinking about the business model and, and the, the, the revenue part. But very often revenue part is overlooked. Mm. So, and the importance of revenue part is underestimated. But the model, uh, startup is uh, one of the definitions of startup is a big organization which is seeking for a business model. Mm -hmm. So business model is one of the most important deliverables. And the business model is basically, if you put one dollar in, how many you get out and why. So if there are investors investing or somebody else investing, how you make money, and this is a business model part. And uh, therefore, uh, starting to deal with a business model, uh, differentiating uh, what is the product you sell, what is the pricing model mm -hmm. uh, behind that, uh, how you get the cash in and when you get the cash in, but also what are the drivers of the cost to, to have this revenue? Are there valuable costs uh, driving this revenue? Uh, are there any fixed costs? What is the cost of services sold part? Uh, this, is, this is not understood very well. And uh, one of the reasons is if you outsource your accounting or finance functions, very often you don't explain to these partners what is your business about. And at startup, the business uh, is changing. You do a lot of pivots. You, every day you learn something else. It's quite complicated to keep the external partner updated. And if the external partner is not smart enough to ask that, you might end up with uh, these two um, parties doing different, like they are on different boats going different directions. So one is just dealing with uh, thinking it's a small firm with just a few employees, some revenue, and other doesn't matter, everything is just on one cost line, and you don't know what's hidden there, and then when the other part is already somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And usually you hit the wall uh, when you would like to raise the money uh, or your revenue is growing as big as you hit the uh, limits of uh, being audited. Or, for mm -hmm. example, if you establish uh, the branch somewhere else in another country and you have to establish a structure, how you manage with the money between these different structures. And then uh, usually the founders seek for help. Uh, they don't know what to do anymore, and uh, very often I have had to step in, uh, look at the situation, and you end up with uh, cleaning it backwards one year, two years or more, because there is a mess, there are taxes not paid, there are some stomach some stuff done not right way, and it ends up with a lot of delays, and this might delay your next round because you don't have uh, all these reports you need to provide for investors. Right. Um, and you don't know about your business model, which is more important even. But this, this really brings us uh, to my next topic that I wanted to discuss, and that is like the setup. Um, what kind of a setup you should have in your team and how you, at, at different stages of, uh, of the company, company development. So can you kind of give us a, a roadmap uh, how to build up your finance and accounting and operations teams and what is like re expected uh, and required by the investors if you raise, ra as you raise additional rounds? I think you have to think it uh, it's the same way you think about the other functions you build up. Uh, first, usually you think you are going to save the world, uh, you are going to build an amazing product which is 
most liked product in that field, and everybody is going to like it, and you buy it, and you make money. And therefore, usually what happens, at least in Estonia, Estonia is very like tech-oriented. So you, if you would like to build a product or some system or something, you have an architect mm -hmm. or someone like a founder with very architectural mind. And then you might have also other engineering people and then you might have tech support and so on and so on. Uh, but at the same time, you have to build the organization. Mm -hmm. So you have to build uh, the team, you have to build uh, the teams, you have to have the HR structure, and you have the, have the finance model and the finance structure. Because what you are building is a business. It's not only a product, but it's a business what you're building. And therefore, you can't overlook having this kind of architectural person or visionary person on finance side as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you, you have to differentiate these roles. You should have this visionary role or, or, or uh, architectural role, uh, like one of founders or, or uh, COO or CFO or, or whatever it is. Uh, you have to have people who do analysis, like a BI team, analytics team, and then you have to have the support functions like accounting. Mm -hmm. But usually you start with support and, and you don't have this person in place who actually builds the finance model. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you can fill these roles temporarily with founders or somebody mm -hmm. else as well. And at some point you probably need professionals. So if you are very strong at, I don't know, marketing, you probably know how you would build up a marketing function. Mm -hmm. And you can transfer this experience to finance and think mm -hmm. the same way about the finance. Um, maybe Adrian or Marco, you can share your experience, how you have built up your team in your companies so far. And for what reasons you have, you have done as you have done. Um, and what have been your lessons in scaling your function, basically? Of course. Um... I'll start by saying that as a finance professional, I usually join companies a little bit uh, later on after they've raised a, a, a couple of, of, of rounds at least. Um, and at every single company that I've, that I've worked with, uh, you have to sort of go back to the basics because everyone always forgets about the chart of accounts. Yes, I know it's boring as accounting topics, but uh, I had advice that, uh, that you always have a chart of accounts that is able to, to, to tell the, the story of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, that you don't use uh, that templated chart of accounts that comes with, uh, with your official software, mm -hmm. and that you actually take the hour or two or day or two uh, to, to, to make sure it tells your story. And other than that, uh, uh, regarding building a team, is uh, it's always a function of need. Uh, early on, you end up uh, going out, uh, outsourced. Uh, for example, in Starship, in some of the countries that we operate in, um, we don't have accounting functions or internal accounting functions in those countries because the operations don't uh, support us having a team of two or three. Instead, what we have is uh, uh, we've built a centralized European team here in Tallinn um, that oversees all of our legal entities uh, mm -hmm. uh, all over Europe with the help of our external accountants. Um, once we reach a point uh, where it's not uh, 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 efficient or, uh, uh, or the, uh, where, where you're losing from an economic perspective, um, that's when it's time to grow. And for example, one of the decisions we made in our London offices or in our London operations is that we're now ready to bring that uh, process in-house. Um, as far as how to bring that process in-house, uh, I always recommend uh, extreme and full honesty with your external accounting partners. And we've developed a four-month plan to transition uh, the operations from external to internal, mm -hmm. and then to maintain those partners as an ongoing partner uh, from the perspective of uh, ongoing audits um, annually. Okay, um, Marco. Yeah, I can talk about the early stage. So a uh, recommendation for all the first time founders, uh, don't try to do accounting on your own. Uh, I've seen it happen that in order to save a couple of hundred euros of accounting costs, people trying to master uh, accounting and tax laws over the weekend. And uh, it, it's not a really good idea. First of all, it's, uh, it's not probably the best use of your time. 
And secondly, it will hurt you when you start to raise VC money and they review your accounting as part of the due diligence. So in the, in the beginning, it's, it's best to outsource, find a professional accounting firm and make sure they do their work. Uh, at what point you should consider having a kind of this hot shot CFO? A CFO, uh, I guess uh, in Estonia we are pretty alien to different kind of titles and it's like accounting and next one is CFO, but yes. actually <laughs> there is huge dimension between that. And CFO usually is someone who deals with long-term perspective, uh, how we make money in future, how we secure our uh, funds in future and cash in future, and also helping uh, to raise some money or go for IPO, go for exit. So it's, it's kind of like a full-time, long-term uh, plan which requires a specific set of mind and, and very different thinking. Mm -hmm. Like not dealing with the past, not dealing with uh, what should be paid and so on and so on or even the budgets but, uh, or everyday stuff, but thinking about the future and, and planning the future and, and uh, modeling the future together with uh, founders. So I guess it comes uh, where you hit like series B or C or D or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when uh, you are already growing and you see uh, the business is scalable mm -hmm. and you should grow even more and, and, uh, and you are more established. Right, so you shouldn't be starting, it shouldn't be the most critical kind of maybe role to fill in the, in the beginning and you can start out with different titles as well, like head of finance or... Head of finance, uh, controller, yeah. VP of finance, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, to, to, to add on to that, all those titles come with their own level of expertise. Uh, a head of finance and your hotshot CFO, mm -hmm. as you've called it, and they're, they're very different people, even your, your VP of finance and your CFO, they have very, very different roles. Um, so it, it's honestly about the stage of the, of the organization that, that, required, that has that need. So very often a uh, founder asks from someone, from investors or someone outside, like, should I hire a CFO? Mm -hmm. And the most common answer is it's too early. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter, you have to continue if you're 100 euros accounting Mm -hmm. uh, function. It means uh, you still have to develop these functions, but maybe you should go, not go here immediately. Mm -hmm. That's so kind of two extremes that you're, yes, you're, yes, you're usually leveling between. People don't <laughs> understand this. It's not mm -hmm. like this or this, but uh, there is big scale in the middle as well. Um, maybe you can also share some key mistakes in this day-to-day uh, -day <laughs> financial management or the way you're gonna kind of set up your um, finance accounting operations functions. What, what have been the key mistakes that you have done that you, you want to avoid? Marco already shared his um, key, <laughs> key mistakes to avoid. Do you have something to add on that? Oh God, if big, we go through my history of big, big gigantic don'ts. key mistakes in the past, uh, we'll be here all day. Uh, but uh, I, I will say, uh, in the past, I have stayed on the wrong software for way too long as okay. a function of trying to be uh, frugal or trying to, to mm -hmm. save money, and it ended up costing a lot more in the, in the long run. Similarly to, um, to, to when a founder tries to do the accounting by themselves, um, at my last uh, company in Florida, mm -hmm. we essentially uh, ran with the, with the wrong software for way too long. Um, which at the point that we were talking to a certain type of investors, it, it didn't allow us to, to, to really tell the financial story of the company um, right. as we wanted to tell it. Uh, the, the, the systems itself wasn't able to support the story. Um, so it started to create conflict. Fina. There are some very simple common mistakes uh, people make, for example, uh, not collecting cash. Mm -hmm. uh, Almost every time I have joined some company, first thing you do is you look at the, uh, what's on your bank accounts, you take in charge of bank accounts, you, you look uh, what what's your ledger for unpaid uh, invoices mm -hmm. and, and uh, understood why these are not collected. 
and, and very often there is uh, money which hasn't been collected for 90 days, 180 days, so, so there that, that, So that means that there are no like processes are not uh, in place set, yet. Uh, so yeah, right. it's it's kind so you of need like to establish like the sales the things. Sales things are accountant, mm -hmm. accountant deals with that, and that accountant thinks sales is dealing with that, and mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a loopholes between these. But this is uh, surprisingly very common, and startups usually need badly the money, and the cash is very mm -hmm. important. So it's kind of like a diversal thing to do. Mm -hmm. And secondly, maybe not having the controls in place uh, who, can, uh, who can wire the money over any kind of like uh, controls. Is it like two persons really, uh, signing off some, some kind of threshold sums or not, or, or uh, having these controls in place. And um, uh, if you haven't managed international startup before, Estonian startups very often, very very early stage, have to establish like UK or US body or something like that as well. So many of startups founders they don't know you can't just like what transfer money from one company to another. Mm -hmm. uh, there is business should go on here, and you should have some. Uh, some business relation in place. You should either issue an invoices or have a loan in place or something else in place. So this is also very mm -hmm. common. Um, maybe we go into um, uh, now go to the last topic that we have. Uh, I have prepared here, and this is business intelligence and data analytics, which is uh, more and more a kind of. In Integral, integral part of finance and accounting and operations function. So, um, what is the role of business intelligence in startup context, and uh, what is what are your recommendations on how to build up this function, and what are really the key output of this uh, of this uh, function? Adrian, you want to start? Yeah, because I'll give it a go. I understand you have a lot of experience with data and analytics. Well, I have a, <laughs> a big passion for it. Yes. Um, uh, I'll say setting up business intelligence uh, functions, uh, business intelligence being one of the sexy keywords of the last five years, uh, is something you should do as soon as you can uh, afford it. I am a big believer of uh, uh, open data, open or open data type organizations. Um, and the best ways that I've seen business intelligence teams um, being implemented in companies is uh, where you have a team whose sole focus is to make the company's data, um, your partner's data, available to the employees. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily uh, having business intelligence folks sitting there building your reports, um, but giving you the tools so that you, um, uh, the, the folks not inside the business intelligence team uh, can be the consumers of the data. Go explore, uh, find little, little nuggets of, uh, of gold within your own company data. It's something that, uh, that, that, that we do uh, openly at Starship and that uh, we did uh, openly at Jabatical and I can tell you that it's, it's, it's worked wonders uh, because ultimately uh, the, the data folks are generally knee deep in data all day long. It might take a salesperson or it might take a, a, an engineer to, to, to actually fully understand what problem they're trying to solve mm -hmm. and go dive into the data uh, in order to solve it. So if I understand correctly, then uh, the, the, the kind of primary goal of the business intelligence function at Starship is to make sure that data is Good data, high quality data is available for everyone, everyone else in the team basically, or everyone else in the company to access. Right. So uh, you're going to like kind of prepare the data and the, the company's already built up like kind of a kind of a data driven way, so everyone will take advantage of that. And you don't necessarily have like a analysts in the, in the business intelligence team, like working on certain questions or topics or issues that you have, but everyone is kind of using that data. And the analytics will happen in the separate teams, basically. We're, we're lucky to be large enough that, that we have both. both uh, we have the okay. analysts um, uh, running analytics, and then we have the analysts making sure that the, the data is available. But uh, as far as company mantras go, uh, one of our company values is, is data guides the way um, so, so, so yes, it's something that we've built very robustly at Starship. 
Uh, Marco, what is your view on, on the BI uh, function? Uh, it, it tends to be quite expensive uh, thing. Uh, when, when you should think, be thinking about uh, instituting this, this function, really? Yeah, it's uh, correct that the PI tools and the BI teams are rather expensive. Uh, we are three years old and we started building our BI capabilities about a year and a half ago. So in the beginning, we just had spreadsheets uh, for all the KPIs and data. Uh, over time, when you add new markets, your product becomes more complex. Those spreadsheets got a little overwhelming. And also, the problem with spreadsheets is that uh, they're easy for the finance people to understand, but to explain to the whole team, to sales, operations, uh, product marketing, what, what's happening, they're not the best tool. So then we, right now, we use the blob and we use Mixpanel. And I think the main value of BI for us is, is, is number one, to visualize the data in a way that the, all, every single person in the team can understand what hap what's happening. Mm -hmm. And second, to have uh, real-time dashboards mm -hmm. so that you can know in real time what's happening in your business and immediately react when something is wrong. So your recommendation is to uh, try trying to think about hiring a BI team as early as your finances allow you to do that, basically. Yeah, well, it also depends how how far you are in your in your operations. Usually, it becomes a must when you have many different markets, many different segments. Then it's it's hard to keep track of what's happening in spreadsheets alone. Rina, do you have something to add on uh, on this? Uh... Yes, uh, it's uh, you can you can start uh, just maybe one person or half person, and then uh, having something simple in place and growing it over time. Mm -hmm. And it's not only PI but also the data warehouse part. What's important mm -hmm. because startups tend to change the tools very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you might change the tool like twice a year for some something. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also means you are not able to get this information from that tool anymore, but you still need this historic data as well. So, right. And uh, visualization is uh, very important because uh, this is something what motivates your team. Mm -hmm. You can see where you are, uh, you can see your progress, mm -hmm. and, and your team can easily understand do we, are we doing well, uh, do we hit uh, our targets, Oh, is scenarios correct or not, or which scenario is correct? So it's uh, visualization. I agree. It's visualization is is very important because it's uh, it's much easier to understand and and uh, mm -hmm. and creating this feeling. And every every morning, the first thing I do, we have is also daily metrics mm -hmm. reports going in. It's like most exciting moment of my day, like having a coffee and looking at metrics. Right. <laughs> um, I think that's a, that's a great uh, uh, kind of point uh, to finish with here, uh, because we are just running out of time now. There have been only two questions from the public so far, and we kind of already addressed these topics uh, during our discussion. Does anyone have anything else to, to add or ask? Um, then this is the time now. If you don't, then we have three amazing gurus here, as you just kind of heard, and you're very welcome to address them uh, and ask for the best advice. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, I hope the audience also enjoyed this session. Um, and yeah, if you need any advice, then these guys can help you on anything regarding accounting, <laughs> finance, and operations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.